How many of y'all are excited about today? As I was preparing for today, I, I realized I should have been like that little boy who um, was given a part at his school play to be a preacher. And every day he'd go out in the woods and preach to the trees. I should have got up this morning and went out into the woods and preached to the trees because I don't know what kind of voice I'm going to have today. But whatever it is, I'm going to preach it out, all right? We're going to see what God is going to do. Happy Sabbath, everybody. This is the last Sabbath of the decade. Ah, man, I keep trying to wrap my brain around this. Some of us have been through the 50s and the 60s. And don't raise your hand because you may tell on yourself. I see y'all laughing. Never thought. I was talking to my mother. She said 2020 doesn't even sound right. She'll be 90 years old next month. So she's seen a lot of decades pass by, but praise God, you all have made it to another decade. And I must say, you look mighty good for having made it. That means God has been good. So today, you will notice some things differently today because our intentions by the power of God and the presence of his Holy Spirit is that something will happen here today on this last Sabbath of the decade. So I ask that you just prepare yourself to experience Jesus. Feel the presence of his Holy Spirit. You will notice some of us are even dressed a little differently. That was intentional. As we had conversations amongst the elders, our decision was that we were going to spend more time preparing our hearts and our minds than preparing our clothes. That we wanted to go into this new decade with a whole new perspective. That it's more about serving God than trying to look like godly. Let me say that again. It's more important that we serve God than we just look godly. And we'll understand that better as we get into the message of the day. As you see, the title of our message today is Life After. Life After. In the context of this communion experience and what we will do today, I pray that this title will become meaningful to you as we go into this next decade. I ask that you stand with me as we read this scripture of the morning found in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. We honor the word of God by reading it in unison. Let's say it together. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's hallelujah right there. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you, God, for loving us from the very beginning, enough that you would give up your only son. Today, God, as we wrap up this decade, our intentions is to let you know without a doubt that we appreciate the sacrifice of your son. And we pray that today we will all understand that we don't have anything to fear for the future. Because of what Jesus did, there is life after. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Life after. Many of us here today have, have experienced the crossing over of chronological milestones. That's a nice way of saying we've all gotten old. Many of us know what it feels like when you left your teens and you went to your 20s. Then when you went from your 20s to your 30s, and yeah, your 30s to your 40s, and I better stop there. Because it seems like every time we cross, it gets a little more painful, a little more emotional. But I want you to know that the crossing over of chronological milestones is a blessing from the Lord. It could have been a different way. Could have been like many of my friends who 
we now just talking about what a good guy they were. You could have been nothing but a memory. But usually, as we cross over into these milestones, it creates moments of self-reflection and evaluation. Wondering, what have you done with your life? But more importantly, what's going to be different going forward? I remember standing at the edge of my 40s, wondering what 50 was going to be like. Wondering if, if, if the 40 years I have spent made me worthy to be a 50-year-old. And I talk to Elder Bonham often, and, and we talk. Hey, the Bonham family is here. <laughs> we talk about how, remember growing up in church, how there was that, that older set of members, those deacons and deaconesses, that, that older set that you would look up to, that would help raise you and correct you. Well, guess what? <laughs> now it's us. I'm it. It's now our turn. And as we do this, this, this chronological review and we consider what is going to happen in the decade to come, as we stand on the edge of 2020, we as the body of Christ have the opportunity to ask ourselves, what have we done with this life in Christ that he's given us? This whole new life, how he delivered us out of darkness, prepared and took care of us even when we didn't deserve it gave us this privilege now to live through the 70s, 80s, 90s, 19, 2000s, 2010s. And now we're entering into this new decade. But the more important question is, what's going to be different going forward? For the last several weeks, I've been in this space in which I've been crying out to the Lord, Lord, I, I want something new. It has been good, but I know there's more. I want a more meaningful life. And after some time, his response to me was something that was shocking. What the Spirit said to me is that if you want something new, then something has to die. Oh, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm talking about living a better life, and you coming at me about dying? There was this prayerful exchange that led me to a deeper understanding of life and death in the context of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to help me understand, Spirit took me back to the very beginning. I was reminded that at some point in eternity past, God decided to create a being, a being that would be the object of his love and to create a place for it to live. His orig original intentions were for this creation to live eternally. And so he established principles by which the universe would operate to sustain this eternally living being. And though it had never happened before, God prepared a plan just in case any of these life principles were broken. He knew then that it would require a death to restore the life he originally designed. He knew it before he created us. And here is where communion comes in. Communion reminds us that before the foundation of the world, when God decided to take a chance on this minuscule speck in the cosmos, Elder Dorsey, that, that, and to conduct this experiment with free will human beings, he also decided that if the experiment went wrong, he would give his son to die so that we might be able to regain the original intention of inter eternal life. That is what we are celebrating today. That before we even went wrong, God figured out a way to make it right. And you know, God, the Bible says God does not change. And since he did it at the beginning, before he created us, you know, he's still doing it today. Every time we go wrong, he has a way of making us right again. So for every young person in here, and even us graybeards, we thank God that there's a plan to fix us when we mess up. This is what we're celebrating with communion. We are celebrating the fact that Jesus came, lived, and died, rose again so that we could have eternal life. This is what we're celebrating, that Jesus did this for us. 
And it all came to a head at Calvary. So here we are at the last communion of the decade with a word from the Lord saying that if you want something new, a more meaningful life, then something has to die. Now, <laughs> I know none of us like to talk about death. Death is not a subject that we eagerly engage in. But since the principal message in communion is that death leads to life, we must get a right conception of death in order to fully understand what we're celebrating today. First, please understand that the reason why the enemy has worked so hard to confuse and distort our understanding of death is because he knows it is crucial to our understanding of eternal life. His first lie to Eve in the garden was about life and death. The first words he said is, you're not going to die. And ever since he told that lie, he has been working full time to confuse us and twist us and distort life and death, making it something feared and misunderstood and spooky, so much so that we can't fully embrace the full meaning of life and death in Christ. Listen to what I'm saying. Because he's messed up our mind about death, we refuse to die to self. Because nobody wants to lose life, they don't understand that in losing life, we gain an eternal life. So because he's messed this thing up in our head, we end up clinging to the very thing we need to let go. So as we prepare our hearts and minds for this communion experience, we need to understand that we do not have to fear death because Jesus conquered death. When he conquered death and rose from the grave saying, oh, death, where is thy sting, O oh, grave, where is thy victory? He took the fear and dread and spookiness out of death. On this last communion of the decade, we can now receive the truth that because of what Jesus did on Calvary, we no longer have to fear any death. The death that means the loss of life or the death that means the loss of self. To clarify the enemy's lies and help me understand life and death, Holy Spirit strung together a number of scriptures that I had never put together before. But together these scriptures provide critical instruction on life and death and communion and how we can have a new life and a new experience in this new decade. So here we go. The first scripture we have is found in Galatians 5, 16, and 17. Let's read it together. It says... I say then, yeah. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do things that you wish. Listen, what this scripture is saying is that if we continue to live according to the flesh, doing what comes naturally, all the hatred, and the messed up attitude, the lying, the cheating, the trying to protect yourself. If we do those things that come naturally, we will always be at war with the Spirit of God. Do you understand what we're saying here? The more I insist on living according to my rules, I will always be at odds with the Spirit of God. And so here we are. Trying to be children of God, trying to serve him, trying to live for him, yet we clinging to this thing we know itself, and by doing it by default, we are at war with the Spirit. And so we wonder why there's this confusion, this dichotomy between spiritual things and, and, and personal things. Why is it so hard for me to get it right and do what God says? It's because I'm clinging to the flesh, and the flesh is always against the spirit. So that's step number one. This is point number one. Number two says this. Let's read it together. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. What this scripture tells us is that if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he can deliver us from slavery to the flesh. Who shall deliver me from these bad habits, from this bad attitude? Who shall deliver me from cheating on my taxes? Who shall deliver me from looking the wrong way at the wrong people? Who's going to deliver me from all these things that I don't want to do but I keep on doing? Thank be to God. The scripture says it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. So listen, y'all. <laughs> we are not lost cases. It is not hopeless. It is all by an equation. Cling to the flesh, you'll be against the spirit. Surrender to Jesus, he'll deliver you from the flesh. Here's what the next point says. Ah, uh, you a liar. All right. Galatians 2 verse 20 says this. Let's read it together. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Key point. By dying to self, choosing the ways of Jesus over the ways of self, we can live a Christ-like life. Jesus died and rose again into newness of life so that you and I can die and rise to newness of life. I am crucified with Christ. I stop insisting that I be myself, that I do it my way, that I have it my way. I stop insisting that everybody has to live according to my opinion. I crucify myself. I realize that it is better for me to live for Christ than for me to live for myself. Next scripture says this. Let's read it. For the living, no. <laughs> yeah, ho, ho, stop right there. Stop, stop, stop. This was the one that took me for a loop. All the scriptures that I've been reading all had some sequence. But when the Holy Spirit dropped this on me, I'm like, wait a minute. This is a scripture we normally use to describe the state of the dead. This is what we normally see as the clear, one of the clearest scriptures in the Bible that speaks to what happens when somebody dies. But then the Holy Spirit dropped this in the middle of my thought process because he wanted me and wanted you to get an understanding of what dying to self really means. What does it mean when self is dead? Now let's read the scripture. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing, for they know even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Do you see what's saying here? If the old self is truly dead, then all the memory should also be dead. All the things that were associated with my old self, all the things I used to love, the hatred I had, the envy I had, being overly sensitive about stuff, always being upset over things, jumping to conclusions, being upset every time somebody said something to me. If my old self is dead, then all those things should die with it. All of it should be gone should have nothing to do with my new life in Christ. When the Holy Spirit broke that down to me, it helped me to understand that this is where many of us fail as Christians in our efforts to be, have a new life in Christ. They, they, they truly, if we truly let the old self die, then, then all those things that we used to love, all those things that we used to hate, all those things are gone. But what happens is we dry, drag all that old stuff into our new Christian experience. And we start coming to church on time, and we get an office in the church, and we start serving faithfully at prayer meeting every Wednesday night. But then all of a sudden, soon as Sister Maynard says something wrong, that same attitude I had before Christ shows up after Christ. 
And, 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 and I wonder, what is it that makes us have this back and forth, hot and cold, sometimes loving, sometimes can't stand each other? It's all because we have not killed the old man. We just dressed him up and brought him along for the ride. Same old attitude. Same old hatred. Same old suspicions. Same old fears. As the Holy Ghost was preparing me for this new life, understanding what has to die, I realized that I had some companions that I needed to get rid of. It between my ears. There's some old thoughts and prejudices, preferences and, and, and stuff. Things that were messing with me before I came to Christ, still messing with me because I bought it with me. But if self is dead, all those things should die with it. Last scripture. Second Corinthians 5.17 says this. Let's read it together. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So brothers and sisters, Talking about a whole new experience. We've been in this thing a long time. I, I think I shared last Sabbath. I've been involved in leadership in this church over four decades. The 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010. And now we're going into 2020. If we're going to be a new creature in Christ, <laughs> old things have to pass away. I don't know, musicians can start playing. I don't know what it is you drug behind you. All that guilt, Jesus took care of that at Calvary. All the things that's been dividing us, he, we've been made one in Christ Jesus. Listen, all, that, all those little things, listen, I mean, I realize we got some little, little nitpicky stuff that keeps us all messed up. As I look at entering and crossing the line into this new decade, I'm going to tell you, I don't know what it's going to take, but I refuse to bring mess with me. I don't want it. I want to be able to, to, to serve God purely. Hold nothing back. I want him to have my whole self. And even more so, I want to serve you purely. I want us to be able to serve each other purely. And listen, we have become such masters at hiding it and faking it. Now I understand what the Spirit was saying to me, that, that if we want a new experience in the Lord, something has to die mainly self. Holy Spirit acknowledges that dying to self doesn't come easy. It will be a different experience for each of us. Some may have to be like Jacob and wrestle all night to get the victory over self. Some of us may have to be like Peter, fail miserably, then be restored before you can conquer self. Some may have to be like Saul, get knocked off our high horse, blinded and left in the dark for days before we come forward with a new name and a new life. But whatever our experience may be, Whatever it takes for us to gain the victory over self, I encourage, I implore, I beg us all to go through with it. Because on the other side of death, there is life after death to self. Oh, what a beautiful life it is. Imagine if you could go through life not worrying about the old stuff you used to worry about. Not being affected by the old things that people used to say. This is life after death to self and a whole new life in Christ Jesus. I'm so grateful today that it's not hard. God gave me a three-step process for dying to self. First, you must come to the conclusion that life in Christ is better than living for yourself. If you don't make that decision, you won't make the change. You have to decide that it's better for me to live for Jesus 
than to live my life the way I've been living. Sure, you may have been getting your way. You may have been manipulating people and get tripping people, doing things to get people to do your way, but there's an end to that that is not pretty. It is better to live for Jesus than to live for yourself. You must come to that conclusion. Second step, in order to let self die, you must hate it and love Jesus more. Luke 4, 14, 26 says, If any man come to me and hate not his mother, his father, his wife, his children, his brothers and sisters, yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus didn't mean here that in order to follow him, you had to hate your loved ones. He was using strong language to communicate how critical it is to put him first. And listen, when you put Jesus first, you'll love your father better and your mother, and your wife, and your children. You'll be a better lover because you'll be loving with a godly love. Put Christ first. Don't be afraid. When you put him first, then your love life will be better. Lastly, you must choose Christ every day. Then self will die from neglect. Starve it. Don't feed it. When you don't feed something, it will die. Don't feed it those same old thoughts. Don't feed it those same old reactions, that stuff you normally do. Give your heart to Jesus. Here's what the Holy Spirit told me, and I'm so grateful I heard it. Every time something happens to me or people say things to me, and I'm ready, my wife will tell you, and my daughter, she inherited it from me. I overthink things, and I immediately go to some conclusion. Holy Spirit stopped me in my tracks and said, let me tell you what. Let me tell you how to think about that. Let me tell you how to think about that. When people mistreat me or say something or do something I didn't expect or didn't desire, Holy Spirit said, ah, 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 ah. Because I was first thing come in my mind, well, they must have meant, and they probably meant, Holy Ghost is like, Psst, squash it. <laughs> Let me tell you how to think about that. And here's what has happened as a result. Because God is a God of love and the Spirit is the Spirit of God, Everything he tells me, I end up loving the people who I'm dealing with. So when somebody says something wrong, Holy Spirit says, Psh, they having a day that I'm working with. You give them space. Come back later. Or somebody didn't do something I expected, he's like, uh-uh. They, I got them on something else right now. And here's the thing, <laughs> Holy Spirit. Uh, Elder Ellison always said God has such a sense of humor. One day, Holy Spirit said to me, listen, after you've made up your mind about somebody and decided they're wrong and bad, and you decided they're not worthy, what's God supposed to do with that? <laughs> what, what, is God going to change his plan because of how you feel about somebody? Is he going to wait until you decide how you feel about a situation before he responds? Like, no, God, that ain't got nothing to do with God, so you might as well empty yourself of your thoughts and wait till I give you the right thoughts. So listen, y'all. As we wrap this message up, I realize this very important thing. The dying to self is to our benefit. It delivers us from a life of pain and exchanges it for a life healed and restored and empowered and disconnected from the life destroyer and connected to the life giver. We must let that life go in order to receive this new life. Listen, <laughs> Holy Spirit said to me, look, do it for your wife. Do it for your children. Do it for your community. Let go of that old life because you'll become a better servant for everybody. Amen. Do it for, 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 your, for, for yourself and for the people around you when we finally get this thing when we finally understand that this is better for me I, I realize that death is no longer fearful I want to close with this one final thought many of us are afraid of dying to self because we feel like we're going to lose our identity this is the only me that I know so if I die to this then what's left 
But I want everybody in here to understand that you really don't know who you are. <laughs> Man, Holy Spirit had to really drill this into me. The you that you know is the result of the life you've lived. All your fears, your anxieties, your hatred, your, 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 all these things came as a result of the life you experienced. And so the you that you see in the mirror is just the results of all those things that have happened, and here you stand. Guarded, suspicious, quick-tempered, uh, fearful. That's all came as a result of life. But that is not you. That is not the you that God had in mind when he formed you in your mother's womb. He had something very different in mind. And it is not, I present to you today, that it is not till you let that old self go that you really will find out who God designed you to be. No longer suspicious and, 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 and anxious and, and fearful and mean and all of this. All of that is a result of your past life. What he wants to do now is wipe away all that stuff. Give you a brand new clean slate. And so you can see who you really were designed to be. As we close out this message, I want everybody in here to praise God that he made a way for us to find ourselves again. That he sent Jesus to die for that one reason on the cross, so that we could find our life again. The life that sin robbed from us, that the enemy tried to destroy. He said that the enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came so that you could have real life, life more abundantly. That's what we're celebrating today with this community. So we're going to do something special. We're going to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. We're going to celebrate the fact that he came. He came to, to give us life. He came so that we could be set free. He exchanged his life for mine. What a marvelous thing he's done as we prepare ourselves the praise team now is going to sing this song and, and after they sing this song we're going to do something as elders and as a church family we're going to have an anointing service and if you're fearful of anointing don't be they anointed people for two reasons in scripture number one to heal them from sickness number two to set them apart for higher service today I'm asking one of the elders to anoint me. Because whatever sin, sickness I had in the 1900s and 1990s, oh, I wasn't back in the 1900s. But, but <laughs> whatever sin, sickness I had in past decades, I want a healing from that sin. And I want to be anointed so that I could be prepared for higher service. And we're going to invite anybody else wants to be anointed to come forward and we're not trying to trick you into joining this church this ain't some something to try and, 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 and hook you to be a member all we want you to do is to be willing say this this anointing is saying I'm willing to die to that old self and I'm ready to receive this new life in Christ this is what we're celebrating he came just so we could have this new life
Oh! 